Here's what you're missing over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. From the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios, you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, patrons. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. Uh, today, we are talking about the 11th Corps. Uh, they're a, a, a union of the Ar- or a unit of the Army of the Potomac that uh, has been much maligned over the years. But it's uh, but just like George Meade and many other things, historians today uh, seem to be taking a, a second look. At uh, the Eleventh Corps, and uh, uh, kind of uh, rehabilitating their reputation, and I think rightfully so. And I think that uh, this discussion will perhaps shed some more light on things and uh, kind of dispel some of the bad things that we've been raised to believe about this unit. Uh, with me is a guest who has been on before. It's been a while, at least a year, I think maybe a little more uh, since he's been on. But we're glad to have him back. Our friend David Martin. How you doing, David? Hey, good morning to you. Good morning, listeners. Good morning. Um, so, David, the Eleventh Corps. Why are we talking about them? Um, they've been bad pressed for a while, and I have had interest in them, um, thinking they had had bad press. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've run across them. I have some background in them, not as much as maybe some people, but I did do a summary books on the. Valley Campaign, which uh, the core of the 11th Corps, no pun, <laughs> C-O-R-E, uh, was the Blanker Division, which did not do a stellar job in tracking down Stonewall Jackson in the Valley Campaign. Clearly, they were at Chancellorsville, where they got a major strike against them. They got major strikes against them at Gettysburg because of the first and the second days, and have been written up by the traditional historians as... We're lucky we didn't lose the whole battle because of them. Hmm. Uh, my personal background is having written on Gettysburg July 1, so I'm pretty up on what happened on the 1st. Not so much on the 2nd because I haven't written on them, but I did do a regimental history of the 41st New York, one of the regiments in that line, which I'll be bringing in as we talk. And also in the background, uh, my regimental strengths and losses at Gettysburg um, now in its fourth edition um, has some statistics that help interpret how hard the units were fighting and actually how hard the Confederate units facing them were fighting. Mm. So um, the question is, they've gotten the bad press and you're right, they're being reinterpreted. Um, The issues I'd like to look at and then we can circle back in the end, either to summarize or to catch up on. um, There is an issue of nativism in early 19th century America. Um, kind of like there might be going on now against Spanish and other cultures coming in. We are a nation of immigrants, but the natives, um, the nativism was anti-German and Polish because they speak different. They have different customs. um, And it's a dichotomy because early in the war, they wanted, they praised the foreign generals and leaders because of their experience. They praised the drill and the handling of the German and Polish and Irish regiments early in the war, and then they seem to have flipped against them partway through, maybe because of what happened with the 11th Corps. Okay. So one issue is the nativism uh, dichotomy, uh, or is it a matter of they had bad unit leadership, uh, especially with generals like Schimmelfenig and Krzynowski, I'll use the English spelling pronunciation rather than Thank the, you. Uh, rather than the Polish. Um, and it is interesting when you look at them. Uh, you know, is is the problem the Eleventh Corps coming from their foreign based leadership, or is it a question of the higher leadership? And I'm looking O.O. Howard straight in the face on this one, mm-hmm. both at Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, or as uh, General Hunt said in one of his writings, is it just bad luck? They were in the wrong place at the wrong time at both Chancellorsville and at Gettysburg. Could it be um, all of them? It could be. And that's maybe the conclusion we will come to as I teach my high school history students that nothing happens for one reason, not World War One or two or Civil War. There are different causes, uh, maybe at different times or different strength of causing, but they may all be involved. But the ultimate question, uh, which um, Jay Pula uh, talks about in his book on the 11th Corps, is was it bad soldiering mm-hmm. or no? And that's something we can look at based on the statistics. 
So anyway, those are the topics I want to touch on as we you know look at the progress of what the Eleventh Corps did, and I guess didn't do with the battle. Um, you know, was it the fault of the troops themselves, their lower level leadership, or the higher level leadership, or just bad luck? Well, so okay, I have I have a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I have a few questions that are like pretty basic questions that I think then can feed into what you want to present to us today. Um, first of all. Who were they? Who made up the 11th Corps? Um, I say the core, the base of the 11th Corps, the Union Army, is, as you know, had 40 corps in it. They were not all in existence at the same time. It was created in the um, Army of the Potomac. It fought mostly in the Eastern Theater, though after Gettysburg, they were exiled <laughs> to the West and eventually uh, terminated to become the 20th Corps, along with part of the 12th. Um, but it, the, the basis of it was the Blanker Division. I mean, it goes all the way back to Bull Run. There were German-based units at Bull Run. Uh, they were put into the, what I call the Blanker Division, which was supposed to help trap Stonewall Jackson in the valley. They didn't. And those valley troops then were created into the 11th and 12th Corps Army of the Potomac. Okay. Um, and... Uh, it was just one of the several many corps, uh, the base ones that we're used to are the first through the sixth, um, that formed the Army of the Potomac later. Uh, at the time of Bull Run, they fought decent at Bull Run in the attacks on Jackson's uh, line there. Uh, they were not at Antietam. They were not at Fredericksburg, or at least engaged. And then uh, this corps in Hooker's flank attack at Chancellorsville was out on the Union right, as your uh, listeners will know. And did not react well to information being brought in by the skirmishers that something was amiss in the woods. Mm. Um, I would have been, if I were there and at a mid-level commander, uh, start wondering when all the deer and the possums and the rabbits started right. running towards me. <laughs> right. uh, there's got to be a reason for that. It's either a forest fire or a major Confederate movement through the woods. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's amazing that the, the troops in the line knew something was going on, but some of the upper leaders, including General Howard, didn't pick up on it quick enough. But it was just the 11th Corps' bad luck to be on the far right at Chancellorsville when Stonewall Jackson's flank attack hit. If somebody else had been there, I think they would have been overrun. I agree. What, what, and, what do you think was the reason for uh, for Howard and, and I guess, uh, to an extent, Hooker? Well, no, Hooker warned Howard, right? Hooker said, you better watch your right, yeah. right? So what was what do you think the reason was for Howard to dismiss these reports? Is it because it was coming from the bottom up and not the top down, the intelligence? Inattention or misunderstanding, because we'll see some of the same going on at Gettysburg. Uh, he's got a basic command from Meade to go reinforce Reynolds, who's already engaged by 10 o'clock that morning, right. uh, as the Union left wing under Reynolds, which was the 1st Corps, 11th Corps, and 3rd Corps. Reynolds came into town, uh, took up the position on the ridges west of Gettysburg. Howard was ordered to pull up Actually, he's first stopped at the Peach Orchard and then was ordered to bring his troops into town to reinforce. And the whole thing gets thrown out of whack when Reynolds was killed. Huh. My, my favorite Union regiment, I must admit, is the 24th Michigan. I come from Michigan. They're heavily engaged there on the first day in all stages of the fight there. Uh, and my favorite general was Reynolds. Um, maybe because it's hero, because he was killed in action. Right. Uh, but what happened when he was killed that literally booted Howard up to wing command. Howard did not have any understanding whatsoever of the terrain where the first corps was or of the commanders or poor old Abner Doubleday who did a good job all day and never got credit for it. Yeah, yeah. Being promoted to wing commander moved Carl Schurz from the third division up to corps command and there's a ripple effect on everybody getting moved up a level as the battle is starting. Yeah. That can't be good. No. In any no. man's field. And then as Corps commander, Howard set up his headquarters back at Cemetery Hill. Right. Now, the best, thing, the best thing he did was to hold a division back at Cemetery Hill as a reserve with a couple of batteries. Mm -hmm. But that weakened his front line. Sure. And um, he was, his orders were, and he stuck to them, to the letter, to support Doubleday. Now, Doubleday wanted... Howard to bring his troops up in behind Oak Hill. 
Howard instead spread them out on the plain north, just immediately north of town, even though he didn't have enough men to make a solid line. Mm. Uh, that, 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 that is a plain in every sense of the word up there. Uh, the 11th Corps monuments are all there, just straight and flat. And you're looking over there uh, to the left at Oak Hill where the Confederate batteries were, batteries were pummeling, literally pummeling you. But Howard, I don't know, he did not want to withdraw the 1st Corps and the 11th Corps once the battle was going. And once he knew he was being beaten up with four Confederate divisions on his front. Why? Because he had no orders from Meade to withdraw. Okay. And maybe the, the ghost of Chancellorsville is sitting on him that he's got a clock because of Chancellorsville and the blame for that. He didn't want to take a blame for losing first day at Gettysburg by withdrawing double day without orders. Okay. So he's going on a field that they really shouldn't have held. I mean, if Howard at 1 p.m., there's a lull in the fighting between 11 and 3 as both sides are bringing troops up. Howard's bringing up the 11th Corps and posting them in order to defend north of the town. Uh, but the Confederates are also bringing out a lot of troops. If he had pulled Doubleday back at 1 p.m. to to Cemetery Hill in that strong position, I'm not quite sure how that would have turned out. I played it with miniatures, and he couldn't have held that either. Uh, uh, another thought was he held on because he knew that Sickles was coming up from Emmitsburg. Okay. Where Sickles had conflicting orders, Meade told him, hold in Emmitsburg. Howard's telling him, come up to Gettysburg. Right. So he, Sickles rightly leaves the equivalent of a division down at, or two brigades down at Emmitsburg, brings the rest up. But by the time he and Howard exchanged messengers all early afternoon, Sickles got there just too late in the day. The fighting was all already there. But Union troops, including Second Corps, are pulling in after dark. Mm-hmm. And they had that nucleus of the good line at Cemetery Hill, but it's a shame Sickles didn't get there earlier. Howard hoped he would. And then you get the uh, coming in from Littlestown is good old slow come. <laughs> it's Henry slow come. Uh, it, literally, it's S L O C U M, but he's called slow coming. Right. Uh, because he took so long to come into the battle. Howard was expecting him to come in, and Slocum had the same issue. He said, Did he listen to his orders from Meade? Or listen to the orders from this new wing commander that I'm not sure if he, out, I think he outranks him. There was a big question, especially when Hancock shows up, we'll be talking about oh, yeah. later. Yeah. Who's got overall command? So Howard, who's just a plain old corps commander with this uh, shadow over him because of Chancellorsville, is thrust into being left wing commander, appealing for help from Sickles and Slocum, who may be hesitant. I think Sickles did a better, certainly did a better job of coming up to this call for help mm-hmm. with the conflicting orders, leaving some troops behind, bringing the rest. Yeah, that's smart. Uh, Wilcom got there left late and went to the wrong place up north of Benner's Hill. He's lucky he didn't get trapped up there. <laughs> yeah. Slocum just did not have a good battle, even right. though he's going to gain more rank later in the war. So that's two reasons then why Howard initially is in trouble, uh, that he doesn't, Think of pulling back the first corps because he doesn't have the orders and he's hoping to get reinforcements. Um, physically, he led from the rear and there's such a difference or comparison between poor old Reynolds who led from the front right. and see what got him. Yeah. Howard's going to lead from the rear. He did not go, go out to inspect the first corps line until around two o'clock. And by then it was too late. And Doubleday was making suggestions again about bringing uh, one of uh, Howard's divisions right up to Oak Hill. Right, and he wasn't going to listen to it. But wasn't 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 he originally going to? But then Rhodes's division beat them to it, and so he had to make the line that he made. Yeah, he wasn't aware of it, and and it's more. Yeah, uh, that the original, as I re- read it all back through. He was going to take a division to form on Oak Hill, right? Right, to extend, extend the Union. Robinson's line right. to the north. Right. But Rhodes got there first, and Rhodes had an awful battle, too. So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, but at least from Oak Hill, once the Confederates get there, they can line up all those batteries, which can't, aren't exactly raking Double Day's line because mostly, mostly they're in the woods north of the railroad cut. Right. But it's neat that the, the Whitworth guns that they had with them were shooting all the way 
I hear they found Whitworth uh, bolts from those guns down at Devil's Den. They were shooting all oh, yeah. over the field. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but that cannon position was excellent to rake anybody that was in the plain north of Gettysburg. So, right, whoever had Oak Hill. Listen to the rest of this interview and dozens like it. Support the show and get early access to special episodes, early and discounted ticket sales, and more. The second lieutenant level and above gets access to all monthly Patreon episodes. So please go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg, choose a tier, and join. And I thank you in advance.